Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for Volunteer Canada's webinar on keeping volunteers engaged during COVID-19. My name is Deborah Pike, and I'm with Volunteer Canada. Just a few admin notes before we get underway. If you've not already done so, please ensure that your audio is on mute to reduce any background noise for all the participants. This webinar is being recorded and the recording and PowerPoint will be sent to all the registrants after the webinar and will be posted as well on Volunteer Canada's website. We have set aside time for Q&A at the end of the presentations and we would ask that you please type your questions into the chat box as we go along. We'll get to as many as possible as those as we can during the Q&A. First, this afternoon, we are going to start off with a few highlights from a recent survey Volunteer Canada did um, with organizations in volunteer and volunteers to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on volunteer engagement. Then we will hear from two organizations about how they've been staying connected with their volunteers and their insights about navigating this pandemic. Amy Bilodeau is with the Wellness Centre at Jeffrey Hale in Quebec City, and Annette Carter is with the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21 in Halifax. And as I said, we'll round off the hour with some questions from you and answers from our presenters. So let's get started. Just a quick word about Volunteer Canada for those who, of you who may not be familiar with us. We, um, Volunteer Canada provides national leadership and expertise on volunteering to enhance the participation, quality and diversity of volunteer experiences to build strong and connected communities. We do this work in collaboration with more, a network of more than 200 volunteer centers across the country with nonprofit organizations, with businesses, including the Corporate Community Engagement Council, with educational institutions, government departments, and of course, with volunteers. To start us off, um, some highlights from the survey that Volunteer Canada recently did in, co in collaboration with the Volunteer Management Professionals of Canada and Ipsos Public Affairs. We wanted to gauge the impact of um, COVID on volunteer engagement on both organizations and volunteers across the country. And we heard without a doubt from everyone that it has certainly taken a toll on nonprofits and organizations, all saying that they have experienced changes to their programs, to their services, to their activities, and to their volunteer engagement. We also heard that many of these organizations were able to adapt during this time. And we're going to hear more about how that's happening from our organizations today. We did see that many organizations experienced a decrease in volunteering. For some, it was because their organizations themselves were closed, programs and activities were postponed or cancelled, and volunteers were staying away, many because of age or health vulnerabilities. One of the adaptations that we saw within organizations was a shift to virtual volunteering roles and the number of organizations that made that shift increased uh, significantly during this time continues to do so and we heard that, that those changes to virtual will be maintained as we go in the months going forward. One of the key things that we heard from both organizations and volunteers was the importance of staying connected to the organization and all organizations were working hard to do this in a range of ways with their uh, volunteers who were not able to participate during this time with new volunteers and with those volunteers who continued to participate with the organization and overwhelmingly we heard from those who were not able to participate and volunteer during this time that they sure intended to return when it was safe and able to do that some of the impacts that we heard from organizations um, because of the pandemic were, again, that they had to suspend, postpone, or cancel programs and activities. Some, depending on their mandate, increased and expanded the work they were doing. As we said, many were able to transition some or all of their programs to a virtual delivery. Uh, many who had in-person uh, transitioned and modified to lower touch and made sure they increased health and safety 
program practices and many of those activities had unfortunately to be canceled or be reduced. It also had a huge impact on volunteering and we heard from um, many organizations that they'd had a significant decrease in the number of people who were contacting them to volunteer. Half of organizations experienced that decrease and again depending on their mandate we had 20% who actually had a surge and an increase in number of people who were contacting them to be able to participate in volunteering. For those who experienced a decline we heard that it was because that it, from the organizational point of view, they had decided not to engage volunteers during this time, or that the services that they would be engaged in were canceled or postponed. And as I said previously, some volunteers made the decision to step away because of individual health concerns or safety concerns. When we asked those same organizations who experienced the decline, if that had an impact, 36% of them said it had a great impact on their ability to deliver their programs and services. Volunteer roles, of course, have had to change over this time, as many of you have experienced. The biggest transition that we are seeing is to virtual delivery of programs and services. Uh, again, we have said that some of those programs have been suspended. We've had a number of, of organizations where the number of roles has been reduced and all of these uh, findings are consistent with other surveys that have been in the field. For those who were making the transition to virtual, it was about half who had said that they were able to transition some or all of their roles to a virtual delivery. Among that group, only 12% had virtual volunteering opportunities before COVID. During COVID, that jumped to 52%. So you can see that there are many of you who are making those transitions. I'm sure you're nodding in the background to know about the work that you've been doing to shift to virtual. What we also heard is the same number of organizations that have made that jump expect that those vol virtual volunteering roles will continue into the future. They don't see a drop in virtual volunteering opportunities going forward. As I said, we also um, asked volunteers to tell us about their experience during COVID-19. And we heard from more than 600 people across the country, 80% of whom were active volunteers and 20% who were new and decided to volunteer just starting at this time. What inspired everyone to volunteer and step up? We asked this question on many surveys that we put into the field and not surprisingly, the top answer is the same with a slight twist. Everyone who wanted to volunteer and contribute their time want to do so to contribute and help and better their communities. The difference this time is that they're aware that there are many volunteers who are not able to do so. So that inspired them even more to step up and contribute their time and skills. Skills is, of course, the second reason that uh, individuals want to contribute and what they feel that they have to contribute. And again, specific to this time, 57% of volunteers said they had more time now to volunteer. It could be because they are, uh, have been asked to stay home, uh, are not working at, may have had reduced hours, um, so, or are working from home. And we heard a lot of comments from volunteers who felt really that it was a great contribution that they were able to make to, to be able to volunteer during this time. Always there are factors that um, affect an individual's ability to volunteer. Some of those uh, that had helped and made it easier for, for people during this time were, were related to technology. If individuals had access to and were comfortable using technology, those were great um, factors to help them. And as, as we've seen with the transition to virtual, that would be essential. And again, reinforcing the time that they had to volunteer. But there were factors that kept people away. And we're not surprised to see that age and health-related vulnerabilities for both individuals and the families were the top reason. Organizations also should note that one of the, the second uh, line there is that it, people didn't know where to find opportunities to volunteer during this time. With so many people, a 40% drop in uh, individuals who had stopped volunteering and those who are volunteering remotely, 
Those were the biggest changes that we saw to volunteering during this time. Organizations had asked us with all of these changes and people having to stay away, what would this mean about their uh, willingness to return? So we asked them that very question. Uh, if you are having to stay away from volunteering during this time, what are your plans related to returning? And overwhelmingly, 84% said that they do plan to return as long as it is safe and there are health and safety practices in place that make it safe for them to do so. 12% said they were unsure and 4% said no. And many of us, has, many people have asked, how does that break down? We found that that was across all age groups. Of course, there were some individuals where age and health was a factor in um, whether they would return or not. But for others, it related to other time commitments um, and other commitments in their lives that um, would mean that they may not return to volunteering after the COVID. So what does this mean for organizations? So many who are not able to volunteer during this time, active volunteers who may be volunteering remotely, how do we stay connected? Organizations know this is the priority, so how are they doing it? Not surprisingly, we found that 70% were using regular texts or emails to stay connected with all of these folks who were um, remote to the organization at this time. Newsletters and phone calls were high on the list. And you'll note that most organizations are using multiple ways to stay connected to their volunteers. Volunteers, on the flip side, understand the importance and appreciate the efforts that organizations are making to stay connected to them. And we heard many, many comments like the ones you see on the screen about the importance of communication, staying in touch with staff, with clients, with volunteers, and not forgetting that not everyone is connected to the internet. So there were many who appreciated a phone call, and even I thought I would add the note at the end of about the importance of a handwritten note. And the volunteer who shared that also noted that they know that that might be an unusual thing in this time of technology, but not to forget that it is important uh, to stay connected with everyone and use multiple ways of doing that. It was also encouraging to see that free online learning um, and self-care information and sessions were included in the ways that um, organizations are staying connected with their volunteers and that was appreciated as well by the volunteers. So given all of this context, what does this mean and how is this looking within organizations? Now we're going to turn to organizations to hear about their experience. First, I would like to introduce Amy Bilodeau, who's the coordinator of volunteers for the Wellness Center co-managed by the JH Partners in Quebec City. Her passions for health promotion, advocacy, and community engagement are all put to play in her daily collaborations as she mobilizes hundreds of volunteers to meet the needs of the English-speaking community's most vulnerable members. From volunteer recruitment to risk mitigation to recognition, Amy maintains the quality and consistency of the center's service offer. Five years later, she's known as a reference in volunteer management, training peers, volunteer leaders, and counseling organizations within the provincial health and social service networks. Amy, I'll turn to you to share your experience. All right, thank you for that introduction, Deb. Um, welcome everyone. I'm Amy Bilodeau, previously mentioned, and today I was asked to cover grounds on all of these points we see here on the slide. But before I do, I want to acknowledge that this global pandemic has challenged all of us to think creatively, to innovate, to change on a dime, both professionally and personally. And I wanna say that you're all doing a good job. It's important to note that we're four months in and getting out the other side doesn't mean getting back to normal, but in fact, a new normal a reality that will have shaped our communities in ways we'll be managing for a while to come. So this applies to working differently and likewise to volunteering differently. Uh, so no matter where you are in the process, I hope this presentation helps you reflect on engagement a little differently and with a few more tricks up your sleeve. Change slide, please. So the Community Wellness Center, previously mentioned, is uh, we promote uh, the personal and shared well-being of English speakers in the Quebec City region by offering a range of healthy living programs. So our aim is to provide quality services to continue to develop programs and activities adapted to meet the health and social service needs of the community. 
Um, that means that most of our activities and services are geared towards seniors, caregivers, families, and special needs youth. Keeping in mind, as you see here, that uh, in Quebec City, English speakers are a linguistic minority, representing under 2% of the population. That's give or take uh, 15,000. Next slide. So our wellness center uh, is co-managed by three organizations, one of which is a public health care provider, the Jeffrey Hill St. Bridges, and together we aim to create a sense of collective well-being and community belonging. So we're a team of about 25 part-time and full-time employees collaborating with over 47 others on a vast volunteer bank of about 402 volunteers, of which you see here that 120 were actively contributing their time in 2019. Um, so it bears mentioning that many of our volunteers of that 120 or 402 um, are actually caregivers to or are themselves over the 65 age uh, bracket, which puts them in our at-risk category. We're going to go into that a bit later. Next slide. So 2020 begins for our organization. If you kindly start the video, we'll have a look at just what the center looks like. <laughs> Um, we began with 14 programs, 13 activities, and at least 135 volunteers actively contributing to them since January. But following the March break, we begin to grasp that a global pandemic has reached Quebec, and therefore, we're being told to pack up and go home for our safety. So as of Thursday, March 12, 2020, all wellness activities at our sites are suspended until further notice. Most volunteering consequently halts, including off-site volunteering and friendly visits. A few exceptions, like friendly calls and transportation to medical appointments, have to be adjusted immediately so that we can continue to respond to those needs. Uh, we have four sites. The primary one is the center itself, which sits right beside and is connected to the Jeffrey Hale Hospital, which you see in this video. This uh, hospital unfortunately becomes the epicenter of the virus in our city by the end of April. So we're in a pretty dire situation come then, but uh, we'll, we'll give you news about how we overcame that. I think we can switch off to the next slide. Sorry to cut it off, but it's just a little preview. <laughs> so moving on, uh, how did our organization deal with the impact? We began a web page with the latest developments of what to expect uh, with the health regulations for COVID-19. Together with our partners, we surveyed community needs um, and began to create temporary COVID-19 response efforts. These would be tested and manned first by staff. And my goal was to redirect all volunteer efforts to what the community needed most within those response efforts. So I worked on risk assessments, setting up procedures, and we strengthened our standby list of volunteers by keeping them informed of what volunteering was to come. Uh, meanwhile, we're adapting all the programs that we can, things like guest speakers, support groups, uh, anything we could into virtual format. We begin calling, uh, we begin a calling service for our seniors to tap into, which is run by staff that have long-standing relationships with these seniors. Um, to see how far, how much this is a need before we introduce volunteers back into that role. We're also connected to St. Bridget's Home, which is a senior's residence, and within the home where we used to hold community activities, no visits were allowed until May. So our activities previously held in the home got streamlined into one sole mission, and that was to connect caregivers and family members to their loved ones in the home through organized video calls. So this was uptaken pretty quickly uh, since isolation was a very big concern for us. And uh, we, although we didn't have volunteers participating at the get-go, uh, we'll see how that develops over time. So that was what our call out to community looks like. Um, thankfully with our partners, we were able to streamline calls in through a service center and then figure out the needs of the community that would be informing the response efforts that came thereafter. So on the next slide, we see the response efforts that we have, identifying what was most urgent. Uh, to make best use of my time, I won't explain each one, but if you have any questions about any of them, feel free to put them in the chat box as we move forward. So this is what you're here for, the bread and butter of my presentation, <laughs> keeping our volunteers engaged. So what did we do? We kept the lines of communication open. That is, we had updates sharing what were we doing to carry on our mission. Although we told them everything was at a standstill and 
admittedly at first we had no idea where or how long or how we were going to deal with it, we did need to give them an idea of how we were responding to the community's needs um, despite this enormous uh, obstacle. So we told them what we were going to do as an organization. And then we eventually have another update that followed saying how could they help formally, informally or remotely. Uh, so I'll give you a few examples. Informally, we strongly suggested that they check in with family members, fellow community members, and neighbors. So um, referring these persons, if need be, to our organization for care and help, since we were receiving uh, the response from the community as well. And that way they were serving as ambassadors, in fact. Another thing that we were doing remotely was uh, the Government of Canada was seeking highly bilingual Canadian citizens to help with uh, tracing and data collecting. So we know within our small community of English speakers in Quebec, um, there are a lot that are bilingual. And so we reached out to them to see if they were interested in that opportunity. So just linking them up with opportunities to feel useful and validated with their expertise. Next, we found boards, committees and studies that were taking place that were relevant uh, to our community and our membership. One excellent example is our local university was surveying the public on their health and wellness at intervals. And we felt there was no better way to volunteer at that time than to contribute to research that would inform public policy. So uh, our volunteers were asked and called upon to contribute to that. Another community group was recruiting 60 plus seniors to sit on a senior inclusion committee this was a godsend to find something that would respond directly to our seniors who were told to board up and stay home <laughs> and stay away, uh, that they could be part of a, a group that would be giving their expertise uh, and advice on a committee. So we forwarded that as well to um, our 60 plus range uh, volunteers. And um, we had our own initiative called Letters of Encouragement and Positivity that we asked volunteers to jump on the bandwagon on in order to encourage our residents within the Jeffrey Hale Hospital and St. Bridget's home. Since I mentioned earlier that we were the epicenter of the virus, you can imagine that it was tough going for both staff and volunteers, I should not, not volunteers, just our staff at that time, and residents uh, of St. Jeffrey Hale St. Bridget's. And so these letters of encouragement went a long way and it was a feel good activity for our volunteers. They loved it. They just had to submit their letters and, uh, and we found a way to get them to the, those that would need them most. Lastly, we invited them to send us suggestions. So um, it was an open dialogue. What other remote means could you be helpful? Uh, this was great because uh, several offered to do donations, in which case we decided that makes sense. Let's open up a donation so that we can get more iPads to help seniors communicate with their loved ones from afar. Another was a professional photographer who offered to share his photos of nature to residents who were cooped up inside. This was a breath of fresh air for many of them that weren't able to go out. And obviously in the springtime, that was a bit of a sad time. So uh, that went a long way. Many offered friendly calls or to read to a senior over the phone. We channeled that need in different ways over time. So we were pleasantly surprised. I think that was a, a great move uh, to make. And where I say bottom line up there, I just want to point out that when volunteers felt particularly unempowered or, or didn't have any means to, to put their goodwill into use and action, we told them that the alternative volunteering is um, as an act of solidarity and compassion, these things can be exercised by following the protective measures to stop the spread of the virus. So looking at volunteering differently means you, knowing that your collective impact could be simply staying home, doing everything that you have to do that the government recommends, and, and keeping everyone else safe as much as yourself. So many of our community members responded well to that and, and felt better being told, stay home, <laughs> don't come out to rush to us and take care of each other. That was something we did. Um, I have mark and acknowledge special occasions. Uh, this was particularly important to our group, which normally foresaw a National Volunteer Week in April with a big gathering event that we do. So instead of this big gathering, we had to switch it up and do something a little different. Um, but I think it was important not to let it fly by. Um, so we did mark and acknowledge the occasion with an email and a photo, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, so just because COVID threw a wrench in our plans didn't mean that the simple act of recognition uh, wasn't appreciated. Um, so I would highly recommend uh, trying to mark special occasions that might be specific to your organization as well, not just volunteer uh, week. 
Given our mission, um, it was a no-brainer, but understandably for others, it might not seem very relevant, but we did send out a clear stand on how our organization was committed to limiting the spread of the virus and to protecting the safety well-being of community staff and volunteers. So we shared an email with resources for those that might be struggling. Um, and we know that our volunteer could well be our, our someone receiving our services as much as a donor, as much as uh, just a community member, a local resident in need. So uh, the message went out and was responded to quite well for help. And lastly, organizing their safe return to volunteering is the highest form of engagement. So you're showing your volunteers in your organization that you put thought, care, and concern into their role, their place, and their safety within the organization. So although we sometimes have to rethink where they're going to play a role in our organization, at least we're showing them that we're going to find a way um, to, to make them feel useful and a part of the mission that we're all working together to accomplish. So we value them, in other words. On to the next slide. We're going to see just a few photos. I think we can keep flying. We've got, we've got phone calls, we've got video calls, and we have our rainbow, uh, the rainbow of encouragement. That was, those were words of encouragement on the ceiling of the hospital. And uh, this was our volunteer recognition uh, thank you message that we sent out to volunteers. Much appreciated. Uh, the adaptations that our organization had to go through were quite simple. I'm sure many of you uh, recognize the risk mitigation, the review of roles, screening to vet vulnerable volunteers. Uh, naturally, that meant excluding current ones in the at-risk category, as mentioned in the research earlier. Um, and also those any that might be feeling unwell. We uh, then moved on to educate and apply preventative measures. So in the next slide, we'll see that equipping volunteers, another really important form of engagement that was preparing for their return. So we created a training video available online uh, that would cover how the virus was spread so that the foundation of logic on which our procedures would be based would be well understood. Um, we feel like adherence to these procedures was best when people understood why. So we spent time and energy in that and spread it out as far and wide as we could. And we'll give you a link to that in the bibliography at the end. So we've coupled that with procedures, basic and secondary, the secondary of which involved a volunteer kit of personal protective equipment where it was necessary for the volunteer roles. And then lastly, we review best practices on a continuum. So um, the documents that you'll see in our bibliography are uh, living documents. They're in constant evolution as COVID evolves. Um, so these, these will change, and I have great examples about that if anyone wants to chat about it at the provincial level. Um, it changes quite frequently. So stepping on to the next slide, you can see this is what our training looked like. That's our volunteer kit on the right. And this volunteer kit comes equipped with an information sheet right here, the correct use of the, uh, the protective equipment, because there's nothing worse than the false security of using equipment poorly. So we did want to make sure that volunteers, even, even having watched our video, uh, were comfortable knowing how to dispose of gloves, when were they appropriate, etc. Lastly, reopenings. So we had foreseen along the months that we would be heading towards an opening, but in fact, we reevaluated our situation, um, mostly because the occurring, the reoccurring and reopening in phases uh, would depend on the activity, would depend on the geographic zone, and to be frank, Quebec's situation was not looking good. <laughs> you have a look at our next uh, uh, slide right here, uh, you can see that Quebec's situation with COVID is fairly severe. So we're still, and this was uh, clipped out at the beginning of uh, Monday this week, we're still responsible for over half of cases in Canada. Um, so our team and our board of directors agrees that our primary objective is not reopening so much as adapting to meet the community needs in creative ways in keeping with COVID-19 prevention. Um, so this, this is what it leads down to, and this means thinking differently about uh, key volunteering that many of our volunteers, we have about 200 involved in our community Christmas hamper campaign alone, um, are going to, to have strong feelings about, no doubt. So we have to rethink our volunteer roles for this, which all, always involved, again, 200 people in the same room, sifting through uh, cans that were donated, that were touched by other people. We have a lot of work to do. It uh, doesn't mean we have all the answers, but we are telling members and volunteers that um, even so, we're going to work to have the highest impact on poverty reduction for this project, but for our community in general in the long run, um, because that's, that's what we do. 
So reassuring them that uh, those that they were helping are in good hands was very important to us. And I think that message comes across um, very well for them. My finishing thoughts. <laughs> um, little things that I, I picked up along the way that I noticed in our journey were that we had more variety in the demographic of candidates for relief efforts, which is what we call them, the response efforts, versus regular volunteering. So we had younger volunteers, we had more volunteers, we had um, from all walks of life, it was really interesting. Um, getting long-term volunteers to follow training was a bit of a challenge, but new volunteers took to it like fish to water, so that was wonderful. Uh, we had no recruitment needs since we had the influx of new volunteers. Uh, we just needed to set their expectations and, uh, and let them know that there might be more uh, volunteers than needs at the time that we were ready to receive them. Uh, our main concern now is re-engaging seniors who were previously using volunteering as a form of um, breaking social isolation. So this is a concern that we have uh, moving forward uh, for the community as well, since we can't employ the 65 plus age range. So that's it for now, folks. <laughs> I think I should be passing it over to Deb. Thanks so much, Amy. So much rich information in there. As just a reminder to everyone that we will be sharing the PowerPoint um, deck with everyone after so that you can have time to go through all of the information that we're the presenters are sharing with you today. So following on that, I would like to introduce Annette Carter, who's the Volunteer Services Manager at the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21 in Halifax. Annette is passionate about building relationships and connecting people. She worked in the broadcast industry for 20 years and then decided it was time for a change. She's completed her volunteer management leadership certificate program from Humber College and enjoys working as the volunteer services manager at the museum. She's in her fourth year on the board at, of the Association of Volunteer Management Professionals in Nova Scotia and is currently serving as its president. Over to you, Annette. Thank you so much, Deb. And Amy, that was great. It was really informative and, and interesting to see from a different perspective. I'd like to begin today by acknowledging that I'm coming to you from Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, so first, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about us, about in case you're not familiar with us. Pier 21 is a national historic site, uh, which was the gateway for can Canadian, for, excuse me, the gateway to Canada for nearly 1 million immigrants from 1928 to 1971. It was also the departure point for military personnel going overseas during the Second World War. 368,000 military personnel left right from here. And later it reopened uh, in 1999 as an interpretive center. Today, uh, Pier 21 hosts the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21, and we are Atlantic Canada's only national museum. I'll start uh, by telling you a little bit about our program prior to uh, COVID-19. So we engaged volunteers in a variety of roles, um, administrative assistants on a project to project basis, committee volunteers through our fund development team, uh, cruise ship uh, passenger greeting. <laughs> so uh, we had anticipated quite a few uh, cruise ships coming and passengers this year, but uh, or not. <laughs> uh, event volunteers with our public programs and facility rentals, exhibitions, research and collections. That was where volunteers were working behind the scenes to help us volunteer in the gift shop, as well as uh, volunteers assisting with our interpretation and visitor experience teams on the museum floor and volunteer projects on a project to project basis as well. Uh, some statistics for you, just to give you a little bit of an idea of our, our goals and our actuals. For last year, we engaged uh, 104 active volunteers, and they contributed more than 37 hours of their time to the museum. Um, and we had volunteer tour guides, which guided more than 9,000 people as well. So um, as of the end of the fiscal, in March, uh, we had 94 people on our active roster. So. Today, this year, uh, to be determined, of course. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, and so the impact. So uh, much like Amy had mentioned, the closure to the public started, um, we were announced that on March the 14th, um, and volunteer engagement was basically put on hold here at the museum. Our cruise ship passenger greeter training that was scheduled was canceled. Staff started working from home the week of the 16th. 
And of course, all of our rental events, public programs were either canceled or put on hold. Um, the rental events are, lo are looking like they're going to open up in September. Um, and of course, that's to be determined as well. And then uh, we also uh, had to ensure we had, uh, next slide, please. Oh, maybe we're having a little bit of technical. Um, so we engaged people in a variety of matters. Uh, as Amy has mentioned, it was really important to um, highlight events such as National Volunteer Week. So I had handwritten uh, over 100 cards to volunteers and mailed them to them. We had um, an email from our CEO that was distributed as well, social media posts and an internal newsletter feature. And of course, um, certificates and gift distribution would happen when we, when we reopened. Um, we had weekly emails and phone calls and links uh, to COVID-19 information, fitness programs, mental health resources. Those mental health resources were really um, needed um, because we were in a little bit of a unique situation with a Nova Scotia tragedy of a mass shooting. And then a couple weeks later, we had a cyclone helicopter crash. Um, that helicopter was based here in uh, Shearwater. And so it was a really unique time, um, everybody being um, at home and not able to see loved ones. And, and so it was, it was difficult. Um, we provided activity links, uh, sent out once or twice a week to keep people engaged, um, self-learning as well. And uh, so lots, lots of things uh, just to keep that contact and communication open. We also had Zoom calls. Um, and those were, next slide please, Deb. Um, with volunteers, we had uh, our Scotiabank Family History Center, which is our genealogical research uh, Center and they came on board and shared what they do and some of the fun things that they uncovered during their research for visitors. Uh, so they shared that with our volunteers. We had a volunteer that helped with highlights, uh, providing highlights for our internal newsletter. They interviewed other volunteers and profiled them. And uh, we had one volunteer that was engaged prior to the closure working on Italian translation. So he was able to continue with that work as well. Uh, again, with uh, celebrating things and acknowledging things, we had our monthly birthday greetings that were sent to volunteers and staff. And our monthly internal newsletter continued to be distributed to keep that connection going information and expectations. So communication was key during all of this time and continues to be key. Volunteers received the same messaging as staff. Um, prior to returning volunteer services, we checked with um, all of our staff and supervisors just to see how do you anticipate engaging volunteers? Do you anticipate engaging volunteers? What are the needs? And what are the expectations? Be before we even had opened those conversations with the volunteers. Um, we stressed with the volunteers that opportunities would be limited because we knew we would have some challenges with the physical distancing measures in place. So, um, so that was key just to let them know there was no pressure, their safety comes first. And so we wanted them to be comfortable uh, if they were going to be reengaged. So post COVID-19, <laughs> lots of red on this page. <laughs> so uh, we ended up uh, putting all of our administrative assistance projects on hold. Uh, basically the key people that supervise volunteers in that area uh, knew it wasn't gonna be conducive uh, to bring them back right away with the office spaces, our office spaces in, in particular. Um, committee volunteers, our spring fundraising event was put on hold. It's postponed to the fall. And event volunteers um, obviously were put on hold. Exhibitions, research, and collections moved to virtual. Uh, gift shop, again, physical distancing. Uh, we couldn't engage volunteers here. And interpretation of visitor experience, we did engage them, started just a couple weeks ago and uh, with limited engagement. And again, projects on hold. I've just included a couple of slides in case you're interested in some of the programs that we've done uh, for the museum. 
um, while we were um, shut down. Um, so some virtual programs, and you can look at these a little bit more in detail um, at your own leisure. So we did a museum from home and our virtual public programs. Um, we can't gather, we couldn't gather for Canada Day, like we normally have thousands of visitors here and uh, up to 20 volunteers on site, but we did participate virtually, which was nice. And moving on. So before anybody could come back, <laughs> lots of measures to be put in place. So the next few slides, you're gonna see lots of photos of what we've done to try to um, make this a little bit safe for people, very safe for people. Um, and actually, can you go back just for a second, Deb? Uh, I, one of the things we didn't do is we don't have a lot of discussion about masks because we're kind of similar to super, supermarkets. You know, we encourage it but it's up to the people but when as soon as you walk in the door that's what you see our, our mascot uh, you can't get around them <laughs> so um, so that's a, a kind of a nice subtle way to, to do that hand sanitizers throughout as well capacity for elevators and rooms okay go ahead Deb sorry um, lots of signage uh, throughout the museum that's reiterated throughout the museum this is all the entryway. You want to go to the next slide, we'll see the ticket counter. So lots of plexiglass was added. We stopped distributing the paper maps to visitors and encouraged people to take pictures with their phones um, and also still explained it and had people on site throughout the museum to help direct. Contactless payment was uh, promoted um, and of course styluses were distributed to help with the touch screens throughout the museum. Um, in the Family History Center, this is a much smaller space. Uh, it used to be open concept. There would be up to uh, four or five people kind of all together. Uh, so now we had to break those up and create barriers and, uh, and create a little sitting area for people so that they would have the opportunity to uh, physically distance while they waited to be um, engaged with the uh, Scotiabank Family History Center folks. Um, in our exhibitions, so the Pier 21 story exhibition, that's where it tells the story of people coming through Pier 21 from 1928 to 71. And it's very much a, an engagement space. We encourage people to touch and, and use things. And so unfortunately, we had to restrict that now. <laughs> so uh, the trunk that you see there, for example, normally would be filled with, uh, the drawers would be filled. They're now empty. And a lot of the materials are in that plexi behind uh, showing that. Our, um, what Pier 21 means to me are the luggage tags on the lower left, and those were where people would write uh, messages. Now we have a big social media screen so they can interact by tweeting or Instagram, um, and of course more directional signage throughout as well. Um, this story exhibition, again, these normally would be immersives that people could climb on the bed and they could play in the store, but uh, now we have to block those off. <laughs> Which is interesting because some museums they would just think that that's what it looks like. So, um, so it's kind of uh, interesting from that perspective. Our Canadian Immigration Story Exhibition. This is um, our newest exhibition. And so you'll see there's fabric uh, listening stations and uh, we blocked those off and put some um, little cubes that people could sit on and wash them down um, easily. And they could still engage, they could still hear and watch the video. Um, most of the screens though, however, we had to, you'll see in the lower right, you might be able to see a little um, underneath the screen. There's a little place where we used to have a sound cup. So people would put the sound cup to their ears. Unfortunately, no longer can we do that. So we've engaged the captioning on all the videos that we possibly could. And we're looking at other opportunities to uh, create a new sound system for that. So that's still an ongoing process and will continue to be um, as well. Um, the office areas, lots of plexi and, and, um, and hand washing and signage throughout. And so um, you'll see that. And then the, now, uh, post COVID-19, um, the staff came back in June and we uh, came back mid-June, but we didn't engage uh, visitors back until the week of July 7th. We reserved the Tuesdays as vulnerable day for vulnerable groups and seniors. We're open to the general public Wednesday through Sunday. Our cafe is closed temporarily. Our group tours are reduced to three per day and they are reduced to 10 people, including the tour guide. 
our theater capacity used to be 103. We're now at 14. So lots and lots of changes. And of course, all of our rental spaces as well. So that just gives you a little snapshot of, of where we are. Um, we obviously didn't engage the volunteers on site right away. We made sure it was really important that they were comfortable, that they felt there wasn't, um, they didn't, their safety was most important and we didn't want them to feel pressure of having to come back uh, only if they really wanted to be engaged. Um, so we provided a walkthrough with them um, and to make sure they were comfortable, they could see the changes. We provided them, like Amy had mentioned, a little kit with um, hand washing, mask wearing, risk mitigation document, which is a living document, um, a mask, hand sanitizer, and face shield for those engaging with the public. And we're continuing to distribute certificates and thank you gifts from National Volunteer Week. And that's my way of kind of keeping engaged with those that aren't able to be engaged right now and still keep that connection with them. Um, and uh, we were able to uh, create a couple of uh, virtual, virtual volunteer projects. So all of our volunteers that were engaged with exhibitions, research and collections are, are working from home. So, so that, was, that was nice as well. And that's pretty much it, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Annette, and thank you both. Um, I think you would all agree that we have heard just a vast array of many, many creative ways that these two organizations and dynamic uh, volunteer managers are keeping their volunteers engaged. And I'm sure with so many of you uh, listening, uh, as we go, that you would have questions for these two. So I would encourage you at this time to be able to type in your questions into the chat box and we'll go to those in just a minute. Just taking a look and um, recapping a few of the things that uh, we heard as we were going through around priorities and about keeping volunteers engaged and feeling connected to your organizations. We heard a lot about a communication and how important that is uh, for the organizations and for those volunteers on a range of topics, that communication should be clear and that it should be regular and that many different channels should be used to make sure that you're connecting with your volunteers on a regular basis. We know because we're all living it, the change is inevitable and um, you may put processes and practices in place and those may need to change and indeed I know that one of the presenters shared at one point that processes that had been put in place and printed the next day a government regulation came out that made a difference to that and everything had to be uh, changed to reflect the new regulation. I see both presenters nodding their heads on that one, uh, that uh, means that organizations and individuals and volunteers, all of us are learning if we didn't know before about being flexible and adaptable during this time. Uh, the lessons that some of us have to learn over and over again, I guess, until we get them right. We heard about the importance of setting and managing expectations as best as we can in a dynamic and changing environment. Um, we also heard from presenters that volunteering will be and indeed is at the moment already is different. And we heard in the survey too from a lot of organizations who were posing the question, um, many questions about what will volunteering look like as the pandemic continues and post COVID and you've heard some of those examples from both of our presenters today. Um, will previous volunteers uh, come back to the organization? Will they return? What will, will, what will the volunteer roles look like? Will, there, we, will they be adapted? Will they be new? And will or volunteers be able to fit in to those roles? And will there be as many? All of these leading to the planning that all organizations have underway as we manage with an uncertain future and trying to decide for our own individual organizations if program adaptations um, will remain and all of this remains challenging but it tells us a few things i think that we've heard throughout this, the data and the presentations that people and volunteers are generous and understanding as we work through this time as well as staff and the public and the clients we're engaging and that organizations uh, it's just uh, a reinforcement are innovative and resilient i think we've heard that from both of our presenters 
this afternoon. So I thank you for all of those uh, insights that you have shared as we navigate our way through. So let's take a look and see if we have, Allison, I'm wondering if you can have checked the chat to be able to see. Yeah, there's been, uh, there are about three questions. Um, uh, two of them are for both uh, the presenters. So I think we could start with them. Um, one of them is, could either the presenters or both tell us more about how they facilitated large group, uh, large group virtual events with the support of volunteers? For instance, on Canada Day was one, one that was mentioned. Okay, well that might have been a little bit misleading. So the, there were no volunteer engagement for Canada Day this year. In past years, we had lots of volunteer engagement, but we were closed. And so at that time, our volunteers were not engaged. Um, so we did a, our public programs team did some programming um, using um, virtual means. Uh, they recorded, we recorded um, Sons of Member 2, did the honor song along with um, uh, Rise Again and different culture groups came together to create a video that actually was broadcast uh, in the Halifax um, Canada Day celebrations and um, and also used on our, our YouTube channels and things like that. But unfortunately, we were unable to engage volunteers this year for their safety. We, we didn't go there. And Amy, did you do any large scale virtual events in terms of but in any, not necessarily celebrations, but uh, virtual events? I have to say, I can't speak to that. Um, we don't usually host uh, very large events. Uh, we did have the guest speakers, but that was an easy transition to virtual that doesn't require volunteer assistance. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have much to add to that. I know our hamper campaign is going is huge um, and figuring out what kind of virtual role volunteers might play. We've been brainstorming. Uh, one of the ones that we're hoping is to switch volunteering really into just a fundraising role and to get uh, very active and creative participation from artists and from uh, youth to do uh, TikTok fundraisers, you know, we're getting out of our comfort zone, but we may as well fall out. So <laughs> we're exploring what might be of interest. Um, and like I said, and, and, and asking them how they think they want to contribute. Uh, so to be explored. Okay, so this leads to the other question, which is uh, really right up this, uh, this um, vein. What strategies can you suggest for retra retaining old time volunteers to adapt to the new reality, whether it's embracing new technology, accepting a role change reduction, or even eliminating the role. So I'm sure you both have had some experience with that. Um, I think uh, for me, it's um, right now, we basically haven't tried to change I, I shouldn't say try to change, but um, like our older volunteers right now, we don't have the capacity, unfortunately, to engage um, a lot of volunteers on the floor of the museum right now. And so a lot of our older volunteers or vulnerable volunteers are choosing to step back um, for this time. They're not saying they're not, you know, they're saying they want to be engaged in the future, but right now for their safety, they want to step back and, and we're happy with that. We want to make sure um, that they're comfortable. But I have worked in the past for roles with volunteers who um, were, you know, for health reasons or whatever, couldn't con continue in their existing role. So it's just having that open dialoguing and, and as Amy had mentioned, finding out what their interests are and how they may want to be engaged and brainstorming and to see if there is a role or if there's a way to engage them. Um, but letting them know that, you know, right now we are unique times and, and we may not be able to engage everyone as much as we would like. I would absolutely back what Annette said about um, many wanting to step back. In fact, I don't have an overflow of my 60 to 65 plus who are um, shaking to get back in there. Um, of course, they have concerns for the people that they were assisting. They're very caring individuals, um, but knowing how to engage them safely is still a struggle with the risk that we're facing and they're very understanding of that. Mm -hmm. So um, we're certainly going to take our time. Keeping them engaged means maintaining just that connection with them, I think, in the meantime. Um, so certainly reaching out to them, be it by phone. I'm, I was curious to hear how uh, Annette's doing those uh, Zooms with 
volunteers because um, that we know technology can be limiting uh, for some. So, uh, I mean, there's still much to learn between each other if anyone wants to pipe in. <laughs> I was really lucky because some of our older volunteers are, are pretty technical, <laughs> technically savvy. <laughs> I might ask their help sometime. <laughs> Clearly, you know, our they, caregivers have caught up. Like yeah, we, it's our true. programming for caregivers is off the roof. They're loving it. And we never thought they would take to virtual format. And uh, no, it's been a hit. So yeah. And to be I, fair, I don't know about if you found it, Amy, but um, during the closure, there were some volunteers that just wanted to step back in general like they had their own um things yeah. that they had to deal with with their families and their loved ones and they just wanted to you know what i i appreciate you reaching out please keep sending me notes please call me when you want but I, i'm okay right now and and if i need something I'll, I'll be in touch but they were kind of um so you kind of had to respect that and, and talk to to each volunteer and, and really find out what how they wanted to be engaged. So I would just send notes and I would say, look, if you're not interested in this, just delete it. But we just want to let you know we're here and, and we're, we're thinking of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had more that would tell me I have a health issue, I need to step back as I was telling them you're in the range anyway, <laughs> that we cannot engage at this time. So it was a very clear understanding. And I just, uh, I think I needed to assuage their guilt a little bit so that they felt, no, it's an empowering action to take a step back right now. It's what you need to do for your family, loved ones and yourself, and for your community as well. So by mm -hmm. reframing that in, in that manner, I think that they felt that they were still contributing just in a very different way. Yeah, absolutely. And like you had mentioned earlier um, in your presentation, during National Volunteer Week, we really stressed the, the thank you for staying home, for keeping your community safe, for keeping yourselves safe uh, and our whole community, because um, that was just as important as, as being engaged as a volunteer, um, so if not more so. <laughs> That's a I really think we're important just... message, um, and I'm happy to hear that. Just want to get in a question from someone who actually asked, was the first to ask a question, and I just wanted to do those two that were to both of you. So outside of school groups, Annette, what number of people on average use the theatre before COVID? Does 14 work for the most part, or do you have to have people waiting? <sighs> Well, <laughs> welcome to COVID. <laughs> so um, normally, <laughs> we we um, we would probably have maybe twenty or thirty. Like we'd be, it depends. It really depends on the day. I mean, we would have a lot more people. Honestly, our visitation has been quite low. Um, so for our first week, we had seventy. Our second week, we had sixty-six. Um, very similar to winter months. Uh, and I think part of that is our, we've been having great weather. <laughs> so now that people can be outside, they're wanting to be outside. Um, so um, we're okay with the 14 <laughs> right now. Uh, it would be really our theaters a lot, a lot of times is used for public programs. So often we'll do film screenings and evening events and things uh, where that capacity would be needed. Absolutely. But we, we'd be turning people away uh, on a regular basis, but these are not regular times. <laughs> so. I'm just going to chime in with um, and indulge. I know we're close to time, but there is another question that I thought might be interesting for you to to um, respond to is around if wanting if you're wanting volunteers to support you in the effort of adaptation, uh, what are the top three considerations or top considerations that you will appreciate as an organization in that process? I can I can respond to that pretty quickly. Um, I extremely we extremely as an organization appreciate volunteers who are adhering to our pro protocol procedures and training and that is the first form of engagement that goes a long way uh, the second one is being an ambassador of the services we have because we might have english speakers who've never heard of us this happens and who need the services that we have to offer most especially these these temporary covid 19 response efforts so to lean into that ambassador role makes a big influence for us and also to still refer people who have needs that we that doesn't fit into any of those roles simply so that we're aware and as a community we can pivot to find ways to respond to those needs so uh, keeping that dialogue open uh, really important in in adapting the services uh, and and then being flexible I would echo everything you just said, Amy, really, uh, you know, the ambassadors and, and uh, awareness and, um, and being flexible, like, so key, <laughs> very key. And those policy and procedures are, are absolutely crucial. Yeah. Great. 
Well, thank you both. We have lots more comments and questions in the chat. Unfortunately, I want to keep to the time that we have, uh, you have generously given us to participate and for all of you on the call today. So I think we'll wrap it up there um, for today. Thank you, Jenners. Thank you to both our presenters for uh, sharing their learnings and insights as we all navigate this time and we, we are not over yet. We'll be adapting and changing and being flexible over the next number of months, I know. Uh, for more information for you, just a reminder that the presentation and the recording and the resources, you heard both of our presenters reference resources that they um, have uh, within their organizations. They've generously provided links to those, so we'll be including those in the package that we send to you. You can also check on our COVID-19 resource page to find uh, the recording and the PowerPoint there. Watch for our next set of upcoming webinars around virtual volunteering, which you heard was a huge transition and adaptation for organizations. So there'll be a webinar on how to adapt and transition to virtual delivery and how to manage volunteers in those virtual roles. If you have a specific question for either of our presenters, they've provided their email addresses here. And if you have a question related to Volunteer Canada or the work that we do or anything related to the presentation today, feel free to reach out to me, my email is there as well. Again, a thank you to everyone for participating today. Uh, other ways to stay connected with Volunteer Canada on our website. Uh, any questions, again, we will watch for you on our next presentations. Thank you again to Amy and Annette and to everyone for participating. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much. Bye now.